Nebraska is home to one of the largest settlements of Yazidi refugees from Iraq, the latest wave coming after intense persecution from ISIS. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry and a Yazidi woman who has made a new life for herself in Nebraska talk about efforts to protect the group internationally and their transition to life in Midwestern America. That's tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for making Speaking of Nebraska a part of your day. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. A little later, Fred Knapp will bring us the latest from the Nebraska legislature, and Allison Mullenkamp of NET News will update us on flood recovery efforts in the state. Our main focus, though, is on one of Iraq's oldest minorities. Yazidis have been fleeing Iraq for several decades, and Lincoln is one of the places in this country they've established a community. It's estimated more than 2,000 Yazidis live in Nebraska. One of them is Nibras Kadeda, who has made a successful transition to our state. In a few moments, we'll talk with her and Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, who has been very involved with the Yazidis and their cause for a number of years. Last year, though, our Jack Williams reported on the Yazidis' efforts to establish roots in Nebraska. We thought that story was worth revisiting as we discuss the issue tonight. Lincoln, Nebraska is a long way from the refugee camps in Syria where Hassan Khalil grew up. His family forced to flee northern Iraq's multiple genocides. He spent 11 years living in tents. Like many other Yazidis driven from home after decades of religious and ethnic persecution, he eventually ended up here in America's heartland. It's kind of like back home, it's smaller. You know, we lived in, in, in farms and in, in back in Syria looked like really safe and that's what attracted me the most beside the Yazidi community that we knew from back home. Khalil opened his own barber shop a few years ago and has done his best to learn a new culture. The transition has been easier because of the familiar faces around him. Other Yazidis who were forced to leave family members behind and settled here. Thousands of Yazidis were killed in an ISIS genocide in 2014. In most every family have probably lost a, a loved one from the ISIS attack. There are still most families that have uncles or mother or daughter or brother still either in a ca captured by ISIS or they might be somewhere in a refugee camp. So there are a lot of concerns where people are kind of worried. This is our English and citizenship classroom. Right Lincoln has become have, such I a popular destination for Yazidis that they've established a cultural center. Yeah. So why do you do this? Why do you have this celebration? A place for refugees to learn the language, how to manage money, and even how to drive. Director Jolene McCulley says they're also getting over what they left behind. With this EZD population coming recently versus the ones that have come many years back, um, there's a lot more barriers to integration. They're dealing with a lot of trauma. And so right now our goal is to help them overcome the trauma and remember their culture and carry on their culture before we uh, focus on integration. Even though many Yazidi refugees are initially resettled in other cities, they often end up in Lincoln. Some of the first immigrants arrived several decades ago after working as interpreters for the U.S. military in northern Iraq. One family comes, talks to another family, and then pretty soon you've got family and friends telling family and friends, well, my family's there, I want to be with them, or you know, maybe I can afford a house there or I can get a job there. Um, and then the community uh, support is a lot better than some of the bigger cities that they've been resettled in. At Lutheran Family Services in Lincoln, Lacey Studnika's job is to welcome refugees, and the majority of them here are Yazidi. Nebraska is a flyover state, you, you know, typically very conservative. But Nebraska resettled the most refugees per capita in 2016. Um, and we've always been at that top of the list for refugee arrivals. So here we are 6,500 miles from northern Iraq in Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. What makes this place so welcoming and attractive to Yazidi refugees? People love Lincoln for the same reason we all love Lincoln. Um, it's, you know, low unemployment, very welcoming, a great place to raise a family. Um, and they really have found shared values here. 
Most Yazidis in Lincoln will never go back home because of the unrest that persists in northern Iraq. ISIS has been weakened, but internal strife within the region still makes things unsafe for Yazidis. So they're establishing the traditions of their homeland here, including building a cemetery on the outskirts of town. Yazidis raised the money to buy 20 acres of land. We can see it's bringing the community together because uh, in Yazidi culture and um, uh, society, they always value cemeteries and temples. So everybody's coming together uh, in this project and uh, they're donating uh, their money and then time to come to together in this project. Is this one of the clearest signs that Nebraska and Lincoln are home for Yazidis now? It is, yeah. We have uh, Yazidis from uh, Texas, from California, from other parts of the country moving to here. Back at his son Khalil's barbershop, he sometimes can't believe he's in Nebraska, thousands of miles from home, but in a safe place where he has opportunity and a future. There's always hope, you know, when I think about those kids in refugee camps right now that are struggling, like I always feel like, you know, I want to give them my voice, tell them that there is hope. There is always a, a door that's going to open up. You just got to never give up and, and always have hope, you know. Hope that others might be able to flee the violence and rebuild their lives successfully. Joining us now are two people who know the Yazidi community well. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry represents Nebraska's first district. He's also the co-chair of the Religious Minorities in the Middle East Caucus in the House. And Ibris Kadeda, a Yazidi who fled Iraq to avoid persecution by ISIS in 2014, joins us now. She's a college freshman at Creighton University. Nebris actually interned in Congressman Fortenberry's Lincoln office, so you two know each other well. So thank you Very both well. for being here. You're welcome. Nebris, I want to start with you a little bit and take you back to that day in 2014 when ISIS was uh, closing in on your small village in northern Iraq. Can you just kind of give us a feel for, for what you saw and what that was like? So it was, um, it was a small village in northern Iraq called Sureshka, and it's a um, very small community, all Yazidis. And it was the end of the finals. Like, it was May. It was my last day at school, and we were celebrating with friends, winning the Student of the Year Award. And so as we were all celebrating, then suddenly we hear sounds coming so we knew something was isis was i mean like when they entered syria we know they gonna come because our iraqi border are not secure so we know they're gonna flee into mosul but at that moment we knew that this is isis so at that moment everybody just like i remember like when we heard start hearing those voices every student like they didn't even say bye or like we were going everybody just fleed to their houses because we knew they were coming and at that moment I was like this is the moment where we had to get to our families otherwise we will be left behind because this is like it's an Iraq we've been used to this and a lot of gun so it was a moment where like we need to get to back our families and that's how I ran to my family and I just got to a house and I saw my mom just getting our IDs and passwords and that's all we got from our own home and we just closed the doors, left everything. Our lunch was there and we just left it everything and we just get into a car with like 12 people. A lot of other like village were just walking to the north of Iraq towards the mountains where it's a safe place. And like at that moment, it's like just a lot of people getting into their cars, just fleeing back home. And even I remember uh, like the Peshmerga, the Kurdistan army were telling people like there was checkpoints in Iraq and like they were telling them, don't flee, everything will be safe, you will be fine. But like from the other side, ISIS was coming. So mm. we were trapped between ISIS was coming from this side and Peshmerga not letting us go to the north of Iraq. Wow. Yeah. And so immediately or after that, you were able to make it to the United States, you and your family. And Congressman Fortenberry, I want to ask you, you've dealt with this issue for a number of years. It's been a priority for you. How common is that story? It, it, what the Yazidi community has gone through, the Christian community and certain um, Islamic Muslim minority communities in Iraq is nothing short of horrific. Uh, they were targeted for extermination by ISIS, this dark, twisted ideology that was weaponized and was trying to kill people simply based upon their faith tradition. I frankly was not familiar with the Yazidi community until the Iraq war began, and interestingly, uh, a number of the Yazidi young men helped our forces in Iraq as translators. 
And through that, and one of the first pieces of legislation I actually worked on in Congress, I thought it was only fair for people who had risked their lives and risked their family's life to fight next to us might get a special immigration status to the United States while, because they were under such danger. So a number of families began to come here to Lincoln and settle just through this interesting convergence of things. When I was younger, I had spent time in Egypt in the Middle East, so I'd lived there, so I was somewhat familiar with uh, the culture and the place. And for this reason, perhaps I was sensitized to the plight of religious minorities in the Middle East, but I, and as well the convergence of the Yazidi community settling here. Now, again, that's during the Iraq War prior to the coming of ISIS. And I recall in, very vividly in 2014, uh, as ISIS was invading Nebras's village, as pe scores of people were being murdered, people were fleeing to Mount Sinjar, a number of young men in the community here came to me who had earned their citizenship in the United States because they had become our translators and now were Americans living in Lincoln, pleading, begging, passionate, angry, on the verge of tears, saying, Congressman, act, you have to do something. My mother, my sister are trapped on Mount Sinjar. They'll be killed. Please act. And then there was a series of things that took place after that. President Obama called for the bombing of mm -hmm. ISIS around Sinjar and saved a number of lives. And We've, of course, been working on a number of issues since then to try to protect the religious minorities, the Yazidis, as well as Christians left in northern Iraq. And that community came to you as well and asked you to make sure that this was known as a genocide. Why was that word important? Well, it evokes a certain legal requirements internationally. Uh, for me, it was important to elevate international consciousness as to the reality of what was happening. And I raised this issue directly with Secretary Kerry at the time. He actually pulled me aside after a public meeting and said, I'm working on this. We did pass the genocide resolution in Congress unanimously. We don't agree on anything in Congress, but that was passed unanimously because people had become aware of the, what, again, this darkness of ISIS and what they were doing, particularly trying to exterminate certain peoples. So that was a, a, a certain bittersweet moment. It was a proud moment that we actually did something in Congress, and yet at the same time, uh, the plight of people who were fleeing, the plight of people trapped in refugee camps, the plight of people who were looking to immigrate or who were left behind still remains to this day. So we continue to work on this. Um, the other thing that we have done now is I have a security resolution before Congress that actually calls for an international training mission, a security, an advanced security mission that allows Yazidis as well as Christians and Islamic minority communities to be better integrated into the Iraqi government's central forces with some degree of autonomy to help and authority to protect their own areas so ISIS never happens again. And I want to get into that in a little bit, but I also want to ask you, Nibras, the, the transition from Iraq to America. Uh, just three years ago, you could hardly speak English at all, and now you speak it fluently. You mm -hmm. gave the commencement address at your high school, and you're a student at Creighton. Absolutely amazing. Talk about that transition and how the work that you've done to try to, you know, assimilate into the into America. And definitely for me, it wasn't an easy transition. <laughs> it was just that, not just because of not knowing the language and completely coming to a country we don't, we don't speak the language, we don't understand the culture. It was just that, like I said before, we were all heartbroken. Like I left at a moment where I would see Yazidis getting killed, ISIS taking our women. So it wasn't just like, even I came here and I was safe, I would still worry about the families back home. So it was not just like the cultural shock here, it was just a lot of things you have to, like we worrying about family, constantly and I like remember going to school I think the main one was language I was just such a hard thing but like that the thing they the people the community the Yazidi community being here and while came in like at the airport I never thought like I would see as many Yazidis I just walked in and it was like all Yazidis was like welcome home and talking to our language and that like immediately feel like home and then 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 after that I started taking care of the language. It's like it's an obstacle that's going to stand on my way of education. I always dreamed of continuing my education in the United States and now I ca came here with all these opportunities but I don't have the language. So for about a year and a half that's all I focused on on just getting the language and I would read every single day. Like we'll wake up five in the morning <laughs> like read it in my basement out loud yeah. so I can get the grammar and pronunciation of English and that made the transition a little bit easier. It's been difficult. It's been three years and we're still I don't think we have adjusted yet. <laughs> Oh, you do Especially so well. Especially with family. Well. Oh, you speak so well. That's amazing. So, so, Congressman, you've been over to Iraq. You've seen the situation yes. over there. 
obviously a lot of times we, we say let's give aid and let's just solve the problem that way. But you're saying with the, secu with the security resolution that we've got to secure the area first. Uh, at the behest of Vice President Pence last year, because he's made this a priority of his as well, he asked if I would go to northern Iraq along with the head of the United States Agency for International Development, who is a former congressman, Mark Green, uh, who I know, as well as uh, Sam Brownback, who had served as governor of Kansas and senator, who is now uh, the ambassador for international religious freedom. So we went there to evaluate the monies that we have shifted toward material rebuilding. I mean, communities have been destroyed and wiped out, and it, obviously it is important to try to create the conditions in which people can return. There's 400,000 Yazidis still trapped in what I, they're called internally displaced persons camps, they're refugee camps. The situation in Sinjar is still not safe. The Christian community has trickled back to a degree, but still remains in many, far away in many circumstances. So to empower the possibility of these, of these communities being reintegrated into this once ancient, beautiful mosaic of religious pluralism that it did exist in Iraq, which is absolutely critical to Iraq's future security and peaceful well-being around this principle of re respect for human dignity from which religious freedom flows. That's why it's so essential that we, we not only make our aid flow to the right places, but that there's a new security footprint that's laid down, again, so that the people there have some degree of authority to protect themselves and are not reliant on forces from far away, which broke down previously and caused the horror that we know. So this is the idea that's before Congress. It's gaining traction. Um, the administration has indicated that to some degree they're behind it. They will want to see it more fully. I've spoken with the Iraqis directly, the Kurds directly. Um, but I do think it's the proper solution. When I returned from Iraq, I had three words. It's possible that the religious, ancient religious minority communities could be reintegrated into this homeland once again. It's urgent, but it also depends upon security. And Nibras, while the congressman is working on the situation, so are you. You're doing a unique effort through the United Nations. Tell us more about that. So I've recently reached out because I feel like I was to a point where I want to give back to my community and give back to those students who are back home and advocate for their education. So I've been doing establish this program through the Iraqi government. It's called the United Nations Youth Delegate Program. Through that, I will be able to advocate for uh, youth rights and student rights and especially advocate for educating those students who have been displaced and are been on campus because they have been for four years so far and none of them are going to school. So we're just having a generation building up without any school. So um, I'm I'm working on that to have be have their voice heard by the Iraqi government as well as the United Nations and advocate for their rights. It's amazing. Congratulations Thank and good you. luck with that. But I want to ask you the question, I guess both of you, how realistic is it that no matter what efforts we take, the international community takes, that it's going to ever be safe for Iraqis, uh, for Yazidis to return to northern Iraq? Congressman? Well, it, it's, it's not only a hard question. It's an absolutely essential question that has to be answered. If Iraq is ever going to be a peaceful, healthy nation once again, some effort to restore, again, this principle of pluralism, the space for tolerance and re respect that had existed in Iraq, where you had integrated religious minority communities, particularly in the North and in Baghdad, as a part of the fabric of that society. If that's not restored, there will be just a diversion back to tribal and ethnic allegiance. You will never have that healthy nationalism. What's at stake here is even beyond Iraq, though. It's the principles of civilization itself. And then in practical terms, if this doesn't happen quickly, there's going to be further pressure for out-migration in the Yazidi community, particularly out of the internally displaced persons camps, the refugee camps. That's going to put pressure on Europe. The Christian presence there has dropped from about 1.2 million down to 200,000. It, it could be forever lost. Iran has interest in building land bridges and filling vacuums in the area. You don't want this place governed by militias. There is a lot at stake here. In its core, though, it's about human dignity and rights. Before we conclude, though, if I could put in a, a, just a comment on what Nibra said. Two years ago, I received a letter from a young woman who wrote me and was so complimentary and she was just laughing about the grammar in it, but look how articulate she is now. Just two years ago, struggling with English, I was so touched by this letter, I invited her to do an internship in the office. She accepted. She uh, stayed about two, two years with us, yeah. as I recall. 
and then went on to Creighton University. We couldn't be prouder. That's class. awesome. That's a great story. Well, thank you both for coming on Speaking of Nebraska tonight and giving us a little more insight into the Yazidi community and the struggles that they're facing. We really appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry and Nebras Kudeda, thank you both for being with us on Speaking of Nebraska. And a reminder that you can watch this episode of Speaking of Nebraska and past episodes on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska. Each week on Speaking of Nebraska, Fred Knapp, our NET News State House reporter, joins us with the latest from Nebraska's legislature. Fred, let's start with property taxes. The Revenue Committee has been working all throughout the session on its proposal. The public got a chance to weigh in on it this week, and, and it wasn't a ringing endorsement from the public. No. Um, there were a total of about uh, 60 people that testified, four in favor, 12 neutral, and something like 49 against. Um, but uh, that's a little bit misleading because everybody agrees there's a problem. Um, and so the 49 were mostly saying, yeah, but you shouldn't solve it this way. And uh, uh, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, the basis of the proposal is three quarters of a cent sales tax increase and increase some tax, uh, sales tax on services in order to funnel a whole bunch more money to schools and try to lower property taxes that way. And they haven't found the right combination of moves that will get them the 33 votes that they're going to need to get something passed. Well, there's a lot of pressure on the legislature to do something with property taxes this time around. So if this proposal doesn't pass, is, is this all there is? No. As a matter of fact, there's a proposed constitutional amendment for which signatures are being collected right now that would say, ah, the state just has to refund everybody 35 percent of the property taxes they paid via their income tax and no uh, specificity about how that's going to be paid for. That would be a huge chunk of the state budget. But if they get enough signatures, it'll be on the ballot and people can vote on it next fall. Let's also talk about death penalty. Ernie Chambers has been working on this since the 1970s. He's gotten it uh, against the death penalty. He's gotten it passed uh, twice. Once it was shot down by a veto, the other time by a vote of the people. He's back. What's new with the proposal this time? Well, it has to be seen in the context of that vote of the people that you mentioned in 2016. Uh, the legislature in uh, 2015 passed the repeal of the death penalty. It was vetoed by Governor Ricketts. They overrode the veto. Ricketts and his father then provided the seed money for a referendum campaign to repeal the repeal, which was ultimately successful, 61 percent to 39 percent. Uh, one of Ricketts' allies in the legislature, Senator Julie Slama, said that for the legislature to repeal the death penalty at this point would show that they were ignoring the, the will of the people, the second house. Senator Chambers acknowledged that he probably doesn't have the votes t this time around, but he said he's uh, forced to do this by his moral convictions. And this was a really passionate debate. Abortion and other issues got brought into it as well. Absolutely. Um, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, uh, who uh, is in favor of abolishing the death penalty and calls herself pro-life, said, I don't see how you can be pro-life and pro-death penalty at the same time. Um, and uh, Senator Steve Halloran, who supports the death penalty, said, uh, what has an innocent baby in the womb ever done? And uh, he asked that to Senator Kavanaugh. She said, I can't answer that. She later came back and said, uh, you know, you can ask me all sorts of questions, but that's not going to change my convictions on this. And real quickly, Medicaid expansion is actually coming out of the death penalty debate. Right. Senator Morfeld, Adam Morfeld, is making the point that, okay, if you want to talk pro-life, uh, Medicaid expansion providing coverage for people is pro-life. And the, he says the Ricketts administration is dragging its feet and making people jump through additional hoops. And so he's going to try to get the legislature to have more of a say on how the plan is unrolled. So that's uh, something to keep our eye on as we move towards the end of this session, which is still several weeks away, but uh, early June is when it all wraps up. Right. 90th day, June 6th, I believe. Okay. Thanks. Fred Knapp, thanks for your insight. And if you want to follow Fred, keep pace with what's happening in the legislature each day. You can listen for his updates on NET Radio at 545 and 745 weekday mornings and 545 in the evening. And you can also read his stories each day on our website at netnebraska.org slash news.
Eastern Nebraska is still feeling the effects of a devastating flood last month and will be well into the future. Allison Molenkamp of NET News has been covering the flooding from the start. and She joins us now to talk about recovery and rebuilding. Allison, give us an update. What, what's the latest? Absolutely. So there are 76 counties and five tribal nations designated for public assistance from FEMA, and that's money that comes from the federal government to state and local governments to help fix things like roads and bridges. There are also several Nebraska counties eligible for individual assistance, and so far, over $20 million has been approved by FEMA 20.2 is the latest numbers we have right now. Um, and those FEMA assistance teams have visited over 15,000 homes in Nebraska in those counties that are affected to assess damage and to help people get back on their feet. Um, the deadline to register for that FEMA assistance is May 20th, so there is still some time for people who are getting back to their homes and evaluating what the damage may be. Um, there are also disaster recovery centers across the state, and there are four of those that are fixed and several that rotate, and people can go and talk to someone in person, but it's also possible to register online or on the phone. Now, the Small Business Association is also focused on offering assistance, and they're dealing with both businesses and homes, right? Yes, yeah, so that, that's actually the Small Business Administration, and they can offer assistance to homeowners, renters, businesses and nonprofit groups. And those are low interest loans that'll cover a larger amount of money than the FEMA loans. FEMA loans are, or FEMA is not loans. That's actually just um, assistance straight up. It doesn't have to be paid back, but these loans can be a little bit larger and can help people get back on their feet. They've given out a little over uh, 19 million so far in Nebraska. And uh, again, those can go to homes or businesses. Now you've reported on the recovery efforts at Offutt Air Force Base. You went out there. Tell us a little bit about what you saw and how that process is moving forward. Absolutely. The, the damage is pretty dramatic in some spots. They had up to 20 feet of water in some feet parts of the base. Um, 44 buildings there on the installation that people work in were damaged and at right now 3,200 people are working not in their usual spots. So they're, they've been relocated to other parts of the base. Um, at the height of the flooding, 15 aircraft from Offutt had to be moved to other places. Most of those came here to Lincoln, but now they're all back in place. Good to hear that. All right, Allison Mullenkamp, thank you very much, and we'll continue to follow the flood flooding as well. NET News has been following the flooding, the impact of that flooding on Nebraska through our daily signature stories. This week, Jack Williams looked at the impact on farmers who are already struggling due to low commodity prices and tariffs. In another one of our recent signature stories, Brandon McDermott talked with researchers at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln about hybrid wheat lines that could be of value with future climate change conditions. You can find those stories and all of our signature stories at netnebraska.org slash news. You can also find our stories on Facebook and Twitter. Just follow us at NET News Nebraska. That does it for another edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to Congressman Jeff Fortenberry and Nebra Skadeda for joining us. Also, Fred Knapp, Allison Mullenkamp, and Jack Williams for their reporting, and all of those behind the scene who helped to bring this show to you. Next week, we'll focus on the farm economy and the struggles of Nebraska farmers. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching, and have a good night.